you. Uh, it's been such a privilege to be here and, and just see you all, like make everyone feel seen. Um, so if I haven't seen you or met you yet, just come come meet me. I don't want to leave without meeting everyone. Uh, this is just the first couple pages of a short story called Archipelagos. Monty didn't know what he had until Randy came through the clearing and said, after glancing at the displays, what a little cocksucker. Randy and his crew left the woods laughing, but Monty pressed a strip of masking tape to the outside of the glass jar holding the black and yellow caterpillar he collected that morning and scrawled cocksucker in big black letters. Three pine boards made a semicircle in the clearing, displaying the fruits of Monty's summer so far. A bushel of feathers, the paper scrolls of birch, the crunchy exoskeletons of dragonflies, flowers, leaves, and stems organized by type, a few slivers of mica, and a hunk of limestone from the old quarry. And now, on a pedestal three cinder blocks high, was the first living member of Monty's collection, and the biggest cocksucker he had ever seen. <laughs> Monty was a little sore that Randy had known the name of the caterpillar, despite the fact that he was the one to find and collect it that morning near the water tower, along with a few stalks of the milkweed it was feasting on. In Monty's eyes, names should be left up to those who did the work of finding and collecting. But he was loyal to nomenclature, and he had no bossy pocket guide to insects, so he took solace in the excitement in Randy's voice. Randy had likely never seen such a prime example of a cocksucker, thought Monty. <laughs> and the other boys envy relaxed him. When night fell and his labels became hard to read, Monty made his way back to his mother's trailer. Violet coughed on the couch, waving away the smoke from a joint before reaching for him. On television, a platoon of knights sent the mud flying as they whipped their steeds to a breakneck pace. Hi, sweetie, how was your day? His mother pulled him into a hug and pretended to pluck a few burrs off his sleeve. She was still wearing the red and black polo from the restaurant where she worked, and her tired arms were easily brushed aside. Monty walked behind the kitchen island and opened the oven door. Hug yourself to corn dogs, mustard's on the table. Violet sighed and lit a cigarette. Monty would have preferred to stand watch over his collection at night, but he knew at some point his mother would come looking for him, like the time she accidentally sat down on one of his shelves, reducing to powder the mussel shells he'd spent all day sorting. Since then, he'd been home by seven to avoid more losses. Monty ate his corn dog, staring out the darkened window while the television glowed and whined in the corner, and the sound of a medieval battle filled the trailer with the clang of metal on metal and the squelch of bodies being punctured. Violet loved stories that supposedly played out long ago. The corsets and broadswords made her forget about down payments, phone bills, and the special doctor recommended by Monty's teachers from preschool through second grade who, had she had the money, would have shown Monty a series of smiling faces on postcards, and when he failed to smile back, would have told her what his lack of reaction really meant. But there was never enough, and so they continued on the way they were, Monty listening to the TV through the paper thin walls of his bedroom, Violet on the couch up late and wondering if her son's inability to look her in the eyes meant he didn't like her, without a word for it. The next day, Monty left the house before Violet was out of bed. He went straight to the clearing to check on the cocksucker. It had eaten almost all the milkweed inside the jar, leaving behind just a few leaves nibbled into perfect crescents. He would have to collect a lot more milkweed to keep his cocksucker alive until it went inside its Christmas. <laughs> It was a long walk up the hills from the far side of the woodlot and the turquoise bulk of the water tower. Monty circumnavigated the chain link fence that enclosed it, looking for weak and rusted spots before slipping through a hole. Here, where the weed whackers couldn't reach, was a jungle taller than Monty, and by the time he'd circled around, this plastic bag was full with leaves. Each time he snapped one off its stem, a liquid white oozed from the wound. He was about to leave when he glimpsed a ten gallon bucket hidden in the weeds, and then he spied a few more, a dozen in total and inside each bucket was a dark and chocolatey soil, out of which grew a plant Monty had never seen before, with leaves like eight-pointed fireworks. Monty knew that the buckets meant someone owned these plants, but he also knew collectors had to be daring. In school, they'd learned about Columbus and how he sailed across the Atlantic not knowing what was on the other side, how he returned to Spain with boatloads of gold and spices and natural wonders. Neither gold nor spices particularly appealed to Monty, but natural wonders did and the lesson of high risk, high reward had taken root. He snapped off four of the eight point leaves before slipping back through the fence. Columbus did his stealing for a country, Monty knew, for the glory that comes with being the first. 
The plant Monty found wasn't anything new to mankind. He could tell that from the careful way someone tended the soil and kept them moist in the summer heat. But he didn't care. He wanted to grow his collection. He had his cocksucker, and now he had hit the eight-point leaves, and that was a start. <laughs> when he returned to the clearing, he arranged the eight-point leaves so that they framed the cocksucker's jar like asterisks. <laughs> he thought they probably deserved their own pedestal and label, and although he didn't yet know what to call them, he did know where to get cinder blocks. His mother's trailer looked different in the daylight. At dusk, it maintained an aura of safety because he couldn't see its rough edges, only the square of light that shined through the dark. Now the window was dark, and brown stains ran down the siding where the screens had rusted. He usually took blocks from the bottom stair, which had resulted in a big step up to get inside. But as he squatted to peer underneath, Monty thought he could remove a few blocks from just behind the steps where they were crumbling anyway and not bearing the load. He was tugging and grunting and half under the trailer when a man's voice startled him. Hey, Tiger, where are you going with that block? Monty popped his head up and looked all around, but there was no one else in the yard. Up here, said the voice. Monty looked up at his own front door. A shadow smiled at him from behind the screen. Why don't you leave our stairs alone and move on, said the man. Monty looked at the trailer again. Maybe it had been so long since he'd seen his home in the afternoon that he'd mixed it up with one of the neighboring units. There was little to differentiate one from the other. Some sun-bleached toys out front, dirt grooves worn by a bored, tied-up dog. But his mother's trailer was distinguishable as the low white box closest to the woods, and the only thing in the front yard was thistles grown tall enough that Monty could see the tops of their fuzzy purple heads through the window when he was on the toilet. Brian, is that Monty? His mother's voice confirmed it. This was home, and now he wished it wasn't. Her face appeared behind the unfamiliar man. Monty, she said, holding her head at an angle and struggling to put an earring through the lobe. I've wanted you to meet Brian for a while now. Brian opened the screen door and held out his hand. Monty stared at it. Uncalloused, it was spotted with brown moles and little pink nicks like paper cuts. Monty didn't touch it, and although it did occur to him that it would have made a great addition to his collection, <laughs> there are some objects one instinctively knows to leave in their natural habitat. <laughs> Brian withdrew the hand and frowned. Violet, pretending not to notice Monty, Monty's rudeness, reached into her purse and pulled out a brochure. On its cover, a group of children smiled in front of a large collection of bones. They just opened a new visitor center in Rutland, Monty. It says here they've got fossils from when the whole valley was underwater. Betty from work went with her kids and said her girls had nightmares about giant fish monsters ever since. Violet had a, held out the brochure to Monty. That sounds promising, right? <laughs> He took it and opened up its center fold to a map that showed a star next to a highway and a blue splotch indicating everything that had long ago been ocean. They were indeed submerged. I was thinking, Violet said, glancing at Brian, that maybe the three of us could go. It's free and you could even bring your friend Rachel along. Robin, said Monty. <laughs> sure, Robin, so what do you think? Monty pocketed the brochure and returned to tugging at the cinder block. Violet looked pleadingly at Brian. It's all right, said Brian. We'll be seeing a lot of each other, Monty and me. Lots of time to get to know one another, man to man. She kissed Monty on the forehead before getting in her Saturn and driving to work. Monty started to crawl back under the trailer in his hunt for blocks. Uh-uh, Tiger. Your mama might have let you snipe the foundation out from under her, but I know buildings. Construction. Brian jabbed his finger in his own chest to make his point. This box is barely standing as is. Take one more block and we'll be buried. Monty stood up and walked back to the woods empty-handed, even though he knew Brian was wrong. There were blocks underneath the house not holding up anything. Thank you. Mm -hmm.